All right. So welcome everybody to the first in our of our three Champlain Valley thinning meetings. We're happy to have you all with us today. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Mike Basow. I'm the tree fruit specialist with the Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Program located up here in the Champlain Valley. So before we begin, I'd just like to get everyone briefly accustomed to using this Zoom format. So on the screen, you should have a toolbar in front of you that should show a couple of these different icons. Uh, so generally, we ask that you keep yourself muted and your video off, but it looks like we have a pretty small crowd today. Um, so honestly, if you wanna chime in once in a while, I think you're welcome to do so. Um, I just ask that you wait until the presenters have their opportunity to get through all their information first, but then we'll open it up to questions. Um, and you can do that through the microphone or you can also do that during the presentation through the chat icon, which should be on the lower right hand side of your toolbar there. So there you should be able to open up the chat box and you can type in your questions here. So before we get into our presentations, I'd like to take the opportunity to give a shout out to our commercial sponsor for our uh, series meetings this season. Uh, it's a Wesco in Conway, Massachusetts. So we'd like to give them a big thank you for their support. The people at a Wesco would like to thank everyone for this opportunity and remind you that they are here for you with parts, service, and sales support through these stressful times. A Wesco staff may be reached at 413. 369-4335, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. So today's focus for this meeting is going to be multidisciplinary, and we're going to start the meeting by hearing from uh, Terrence Robinson of Cornell University Agritech, who's going to be walking us through how to handle early thinning strategies this season. After we hear from Terrence, we're going to review insect pest management with Peter Yench, disease management with Dr. Sergin Asimovich, and sunburn management with Donna Asimovich, all of whom are joining us today from the Hudson Valley. We will then hear a few comments about bitter pit suppression and pre-harvest bitter pit prediction tools with Dan Donahue, who is my colleague on the Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Program team. And then I will wrap things up briefly discussing some post-bloom weed management strategies. We're also joined today by Andy Gallimberti, who is the Eastern New York technician located here in the Champlain Valley, who will also be monitoring the chat box alongside me today. And again, we invite you to submit any of your questions into the chat box throughout the presentations. And at the conclusion of each presentation, uh, we can also open it up to allow people to unmute themselves and ask questions directly since we, have, we do have a smaller group today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Terrence Robinson. Good afternoon. Uh, it's great to see many of you that I know and um, hope we can get some useful help this morning, this afternoon on uh, thinning. I have a few slides I would like to present uh, to, at the beginning. <clears throat> and, um, I wanted to uh, comment briefly that I'm very pleased with uh, that a number of you have tried blossom thinning this year. I'll make some comments on what I think about that and whether it's working or not as we move forward. <clears throat> but I wanted to start by just um, echoing the comment that was made earlier that the Champlain Valley seems to have a normal type of year with great bloom and great crop potential. Now, I have not personally been there yet. I plan to make a trip um, before the, the normal 10 millimeter type meeting that we'll have next week. I won't stop and talk to any of you. I'm just gonna be in your orchards and if you see me just wave from a distance. But <clears throat> having not seen the crop myself, I rely a lot on Mike's eyes and it sounds like a wonderful crop which requires, I think, a significant thinning effort, both to prevent biennial bearing of Honeycrisp, but also to get uh, optimum fruit numbers and good fruit size on Snapdragon and, and all the other varieties. 
We've been suggesting for a number of years now this precision chemical thinning approach, which uses sequential thinning sprays to get from an initial flower bud number down to a target fruit number. And the first step is the blossom thinning <coughs> spray or sprays <coughs> using the pollen tube growth model. And those should have already gone on. And we'll, we won't talk a lot about them, but I'll just give some comments on what I think happened. <coughs> but typically, about a week after those sprays, a petal fall spray would go on. Using the more traditional thinners of NA and 7 typically at that timing, <clears throat> and we judge when to put it on and what rate to put on using the carbon balance model. But then after those first two sprays, <clears throat> it's critical to assess how many fruits are still growing using the fruit growth rate model, which requires you to measure <clears throat> Uh, 15 clusters on five trees and record all the diameters. We measure them three days after spraying and eight days after spraying. <clears throat> and then you put it in the model and it tells you about how many fruits you've knocked off and how many are still growing. <clears throat> I'm going to emphasize this about three times in this presentation. I've asked at various times at the winter fruit schools and at the earlier meetings that I hope that some people would volunteer to measure fruit growth rate and send it to me. About two days ago, or maybe it was yesterday, I don't remember, um, we got in a situation in the Hudson Valley where we're facing extreme temperatures, massive carbohydrate deficits, and people want me to tell them how much to thin. But nobody had measured any fruits, and I really got after people maybe much more than I should have, and I said, look, if you'd measure fruits, I could give you a really educated advice, but without that, I don't know how many fruits were killed in the frost, how many fruits you killed with a petal fall or bloom spray, and how many are still growing, and it's like flying blind. I don't want to get in that situation in the Champlain Valley, but I, I think we already have a couple people lined up to measure, but the more that can measure, the better kind of advice I can give you at the next meeting about what to spray at the 10 to 12 millimeter stage. If we spray that spray, and I say if, because it may be this year, we may not need it. I'm gonna talk about that a little later. But if we spray that one, we begin measure fruits and determine whether we need to spray a fourth time at the 16 to 20 millimeter stage to get down to the reasonable fruit number. Now with that sort of a plan, <clears throat> there are several options at each one of those timings for chemicals. And I've highlighted the chemical that I like at each timing. At the bloom timing, we can spray a number of different hormone type chemicals or ammonium thiosulfate, which is a caustic, or lime sulfur and oil. Unfortunately, lime sulfur and oil have no New York registration yet. So I've been suggesting ammonium thiosulfate, which although does not have a thinning label, is legal to spray as a foliar nitrogen fertilizer because it is a nitrogen compound at a rate of two and a half gallons to the acre gives you a little nitrogen boost like a urea spray, but it also causes thinning if applied at the exact timing needed. If people miss that <clears throat> ammonium thiosulfate spray because it's already, the timing's already passed, you can go back and or spray today if you wanted, just one of the hormone type thinners. An NA at 10 parts per million during bloom would be my second option. Amethyn has also been recently registered for use during bloom. Previously, it would just had a petal fall registration. Maxell could also be used during bloom, and some people use Promlin as to get a little head start on thinning with Galas. But today, I want to talk mostly about the petal fall spray, <clears throat> which is coming up. And we can either take a very conservative approach and spray seven alone, or Amethyn alone or slightly more aggressive approach, spraying Maxell and seven or NA and seven. And for those people who want to market into a uh, supermarket chain that won't accept Carbaryl or seven, the Maxell and NAA combination has worked well for us, thus avoiding seven. I won't talk about the later sprays much, but you see highlighted the two different chemicals that I like, one for each timing. Let me take a look back at the pollen tube growth model and blossom thinning. <clears throat> now, the pollen tube growth model requires you to enter the hour, the day and the hour, when enough bloom is open to reach your target fruit number. 
and then you start the clock and after a few hours of pollen tubes growing, generally it's between about 30 hours and 48 hours, it tells you to spray ATS or lime sulfur and oil. The model this year in the Champlain Valley indicated that we should spray either Sunday or Monday ATS and maybe some people sprayed on Saturday depending on what the model said. We suggested that you spray at 60%. Now, if you sprayed Saturday, the model would have told you that you need to spray again on Monday. Mike and I talked on Monday, and it seemed to me that the blossom, all the blossoms opened so rapidly, all sort of in the same time, that if you sprayed on Sunday or Monday, you were probably hitting all the blossoms anyway with your first spray. And the second spray probably wouldn't do much more, but it also would be a little more risky because of the high temperatures that you had on Monday and today. So I said, let's skip the second spray due to the high temperatures and count on that first spray hitting most of the flowers. And the ones we didn't get that might not have been open, we'll take care of with a petal fall spray. I hope that was the right decision. It was one that I was worried about because ATS under high temperatures gives more leaf burn than under more normal temperatures. If we would have been in the mid 70s, I would have said spray the second ATS spray. But in the mid 80s, approaching 90, it gave me some concern and I hope that uh, that was the right decision. Now, as we look at that in the past, that gives us now the opportunity to look forward to what is going to happen next. I really believe in the carbohydrate model as a tool to avoid overthinning, especially in a warm year like this one where temperatures seem to continue to want to stay high. There's both a web-based version and a mobile phone app called Malusim. I tried to get most of you to download it last year. If you didn't, just go to the iTunes store and download it or to the Android store and download it for your phone. The one caution I want to give with hot temperatures is that we generally are fearful and cautious when spraying when the average carbohydrate deficit for a seven day period around spraying window is minus 60 or lower. When it gets really negative, minus 60, minus 70, minus 80, there's a lot of natural thinning that happens from just the carbohydrate deficit. And then you overlay that with a chemical that's when we often get over thinning. Yesterday in an emergency meeting with the Hudson Valley growers, looking at minus 90 uh, carbohydrate deficits in some parts of the valley and in other parts, you know, even worse, there were a couple places where I said you should not spray on that particular day because of the carbohydrate deficits. The deficits that are predicted for the Champlain Valley are not quite so severe. But there's a couple of days that are around that minus 60. <clears throat> I'll get to that in just the next slide. First, let me remind you that we have some suggestions that the carbohydrate model helps you identify of when to spray. The petal fall thinners seem to work best if we spray them when the degree day accumulation from full bloom is between 100 and 125. Now that's generally when fruits are about five to six, the kings on a variety are between five and six millimeters. So we'll look at that in the next couple of slides when I look at specific output for both Peru and Shay-Z. I also will remind you that we suggest that the 12 millimeter spray be sprayed when degree day accumulation is between 200 and 250. And then if we need that last rescue spray when fruits are big at 18 millimeters, we spray that between 300 and 350. Now let's talk about what the output is here. It's like- Hey, uh, Terrence, um, we got a, um, someone in the chat who just wanted to clarify, is that the D base 43? No, this is degree day base 38, which is a plant-based model which we've built into the carbohydrate model. So don't look at degree days from anybody else, any insect base, this is a specific plant-based model. And the beauty of the carbohydrate model, as you see in this slide, is that it calculates it for you at base 38. I have here in the top part of the graph for Peru, 
the carbohydrate balance that I ran just an hour ago. And it's interesting in some respects that because all the way from green tip till now, you've never had a positive carbohydrate period. There have been a few positive days, but you could haven't been able to string together five to seven days of positive carbohydrate balance. So this is a, little, a, a small concern because the trees are kind of running on reserves. They're making some carbohydrate, but never enough on any particular week. Now, basically from May 11th, we've got a downward trend culminating in yesterday and then today. It's predicted that this balance will get less negative over the next couple of days. And if we look at the data from the chart that makes up the chart in the bottom part of the slide, you'll see that if we go all the way down to May 29th, May 30th, May 31st, we are having less of a carbohydrate deficit going from minus 60 to minus 12 to a positive 28 and a positive 24. That's because the temperatures are moderating down into the 60s and this heat wave will pass. That's an important thing to keep in mind as we go forward with what's going to happen. <clears throat> now in the last number column, you'll see the degree of day accumulations assuming that to run this, I put full bloom in Peru on the 23rd. Now you can correct me and maybe if you, if we could do it quickly, I could put a different date if that's not when you want to be called full bloom. But it would indicate that as of today, we are about halfway to the 100 to the 125 degree days that we would like to get to before a petal fall spray. The beauty of the model is it projects based on forecast when you'll reach that. So it's telling me that on May 28th, I'll get to 100 and then I have to about May 30th. That basically is Thursday to Saturday would be about the optimum time to put on a petal fall spray for thinning. Now, if you go beyond that, it still works, but it gives us a narrow window to assess what happened with the fruit growth rate model before we get to the sweet spot of 200 to 250 degree days for the normal 12 millimeter spray. Now, the model doesn't project that far forward. It only projects up through June 1st and would be at about 120 five degree day. Well, did I switch slides already? I went to Shay-Z. It'll show that in Peru that we would be uh, about 150 degree days on June 1st, which means that the following week sometime, assuming it stays reasonable temperatures, we would get to the normal 12 millimeter timing. Now Shay-Z is a little bit behind. I put one day or two days later uh, full bloom at May 25th. And you'll see that uh, today on May 26th, we've only got 35 degree days, and we'll be getting to this 100 to 125 degree days on Saturday, May 30th, through Monday, June 1st. You'll also notice that the daily deficits here in this column are never quite as negative as they were at Peru. And I just want to go back because I missed that, but so you can see that these daily deficits and the cumulative average deficit um, get into the minus 60 in a couple of days on the 28th and the 29th. And that will give us a, a, a slightly more negative um, seven day average. But the computer is also looking forward seven days. So it's, it's estimating that these later days in that seven day window are gonna be positive. So this number is what's in the chart on the next to the last column. It shows that in the Champlain Valley, we don't expect any deficits like we're expecting long-term and weekly average deficits like we are in the Hudson Valley. So the last column shows a green box with apply standard rates. It tells us that even though there are some daily deficits because of this heat, over seven day average, it's not gonna be that bad. And we probably can do very well as far as thinning with standard chemical rates. The same is the result in the Shay-Z area. And you'll see that um, we're going, I guess it is a kind of a predicted on the 28th to get to a minus 71 and a minus 67 on the 29th. But the overall average is still above a minus 40 when we get into that time period. Once we spray the petal fall spray, I really want to emphasize again a second time that we need most farms to measure fruits 
give me the data so that when we talk again about the 10 milliliter timing, that I can give you more precise information and suggestions. I know it's a pain in the neck, but if you've got a million dollar crop hanging out there and over thinning is very costly, especially when you thin in heat, it would be worth every penny to measure fruits and know exactly how many fruits you knocked off with your bloom and your petal fall spray. <clears throat> so let me try to summarize some of my thoughts. Um, every year we say the same thing, that it's important to assess each block and each variety. Mostly I hear good bloom and little damage, but I would like you to look at your own flowers and see if the kings are there. If 40% of the kings are gone, then that suggests 40 or more, that suggests we thin with lower rates. If like in some places in the Hudson Valley, total flower damage is greater than 75%, I don't think it's in at all. But for most orchards, from what I hear in the Champlain Valley, damage is much less than that. Therefore, you would probably want to thin in a normal strategy. That starts with the blossom thinning spray. Now I'm very pleased to hear from Mike that a number of you did try some ATS this year. Now we're looking forward to, in the next few days, applying a petal fall spray, and then you have to assess the response. I gave two cautions for both Western New York and the Capital District and the Hudson Valley, that where there's been frost damage, the bottom of the tree needs no thinner. It will thin easy and just with drift from the rest of the tree, you'll get enough thinning. However, in the Champlain Valley, if you had no frost damage, you'll want to put on a normal spray pattern at the petal fall timing. Normal spray pattern is two thirds in the top and one third in the bottom. And at the later timing, we might ask you to turn off the bottom nozzle depending on how the fruit looks when we measure fruit with diameter. This year, and like many years, but especially this year, I would suggest not using Regulade in your thinners or oil. The Regulade becomes a problem when you have to put on streptomycin at the same time as your thinner. And a uh, surgeon will probably comment on this later because I think we ran into some of that already with the blossom thinning sprays when we needed to put on a strep spray. I didn't want Regulade mixed with the ATS you get more phyto if Regulade's in there, or oil. So the same with the post-bloom thinners. Don't put Regulator oil because sometimes the thinning is much greater than what we expect. <clears throat> now, my specific suggestions for the Pelfall spray this year are these. It appears to me, based on the forecast, that the best timing for the Peru area is sometime between Thursday, May 28th, and Saturday, May 30th. However, for the Chez Z area, it'd be sometime Saturday, May 30th through Monday, June 1st. And I saw that um, Crown Point was on this call and I did, couldn't find a weather station for Crown Point, but now I'm remembering, I think I used to use a Vermont station that more represents that part of uh, the Champlain Valley, but I didn't run it, but you can run it and hopefully it will indicate those same windows as the Peru area. My suggestions are these. Thursday and Friday are forecasted to have temperatures in the mid 80s and daily deficits in the Peru area of minus 60. They will be excellent days for thinning if you want aggressive thinning. If, however, you don't want aggressive thinning, Saturday appears to be a day in the mid 70s and daily deficits of only minus 12 and will probably be your best option if you want only mild thinning. Now let me comment about petal fall and what I call aggressive thinning versus mild thinning. We did this 18-year study at Geneva and I sprayed at petal fall in every possible kind of year. On years like this one where we had warm temperatures at petal fall, I got great thinning but never over thinning. So the chemicals that we'll suggest, say NA and 7, are quite safe at petal fall. They will not over thin, but when the temperatures are high, we got essentially all the thinning we needed and we never had to thin another time that year. 
So this is my last point. It is possible that if you utilize the warm temperatures of Friday and you did blossom thin already, you might get near perfect thinning with just the petal fall spray combined with the blossom thinning spray. If you are worried that there might be less bloom or less crop, or you might have overdone the blossom thinning, then I would wait to Saturday when temperatures are milder and the deficit is milder, but you also get less thinning on a mild day, followed by several mild days after that. My suggestions are to use the normal rates. Even the temperatures of Thursday and Friday in mid 80s and a daily deficit of minus 60 don't scare me at petal fall timing. So seven and a half parts of NA or three ounces plus a pint of seven on honey crisp so we can get repeat bloom, gala so we can get fruit size, and snapdragon so we can get fruit size. Now I want to emphasize, I put in parentheses, mature snapdragon. Unfortunately, many snapdragon orchards are still young. When they are young, they thin easier. And so if they were young orchards, I would only put on five parts of NAA at this time. But for mature snapdragon, they get harder and harder to thin, and fruit size is an issue with that variety, especially in the Champlain. Therefore, I would suggest the higher rate of seven and a half parts a million of NA on mature snapdragon. Mature for me is five years or older, maybe older than five years. Now for more traditional varieties like Macintosh, I think five parts of NA plus a pint of seven at petal fall and the warm temperatures might just do the trick. It might be all the thinning we need. Remember, I don't uh, like seven on Cortland, so I just suggest the five, uh, five parts or two ounces of NA on Cortland. I once again state that uh, the warm temperatures of the mid 80s on Thursday and Friday might be worrisome to some. I look at it as a real positive because we have some deficit to work with. Petal fall is a timing when fruits are not that susceptible to thinners. We have never over thin at those rates. And so I think it's a real opportunity maybe to get all of the thinning done. <clears throat> But to really know how good of a thinning job you did with your bloom thinning and petal fall sprays, you have to measure fruits. So three days after the petal fall spray, go out and tag 15 sprays on five trees and measure all the fruits. You have to count the total number of flower clusters on those five trees. It's all written up in the fruit growth rate model and Mike can help you. And then go back and measure those same clusters eight days after. Put it in the fruit growth rate model and you'll know immediately the answer. You can also send me the data and I'll interpret it and give you further suggestions. That would really, really help us know how well we did in blossom and petal fall spraying. And this might be the year when those two sprays are enough and we can quit. But we won't know that without fruit growth rate measurements. So with that, I'd like to stop and answer any questions. All right. Great. I have a question. Uh, I'm sorry, Mike. Nope, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. So, so yeah, uh, many growers are now applying straps with uh, uh, Regulate and oil, but since we apply thinners, how many days would you recommend we should avoid adding uh, Regulate or oil uh, to our sprays? Let me, let me answer that in two parts. For ATS, I think only 24 hours is required. And so the Champlain people that applied ATS on Sunday or Monday, I think today they could have gone back in with strep and regulate. And apparently some people like LI 700 in the East, that's also fine. Regulate is the more traditional one for me. However, in the Hudson Valley and other places where we're already putting on hormone type thinners, that regulate will have some impact up to two to three days after the application of NAA and 7. So if we're putting on NAA and 7 or Maxell and 7, I like two days between those sprays. Now that may not be possible. You, ha you have to spray for fire blight when you got that risk. And so I understand, but I hope we could at least get 24 hours always. And if it's a hormone type spray, 48 hours. Thank you. 
Terrence, Will Gunnison, just question in regards to, we have some young honeycrisp trees that are in their second and third leaf, uh, have had a small amount of growth, and we want to defruit the tree uh, to try to put the growth into the tree. What is your recommendation for what we should do to defruit those trees? The best thing that we've had that works without stunting tree growth is Maxell 7 and oil. So a full shot of 100 parts per million of Maxell, which is 64 ounces per 100, and a pint of 7 and a uh, pint of oil, those three things will pretty much defruit the young honeycrisp tree. Okay, thank you. Now, we could do the same with NAA, high rates of NAA, say 10 or 15 parts of NAA, but NAA stunts growth for about 10 days and it slows shoot growth down for 10 days. And where your goal is to get them to grow, I prefer to use the Maxell because it doesn't slow down shoot growth. Okay, thank you. Karen, how much oil? A pint of oil per hundred. It's not a lot. Terrence, any concern with the, uh, the dry soil conditions and what effect that might have on thinning this season? Well, I hadn't even heard that it was dry up there. I guess I haven't thought to even ask the question. Tell me a little bit about it. How dry is it? Uh, so I, I would remember say, in the Hudson Valley some years it was bone dry and I would kick the ground and it was just really dry. But is okay. it really dry? Looking at the irrigation model on NUA, we are in a bit of a deficit. Um, and we also had that as a write-in question from Tim Petch, I believe. And Tim, if you're on the call, if you want to unmute yourself and, and ask further, feel free to jump in. But I do believe we have been seeing a bit of a deficit on uh, the irrigation model. I should have run that. I didn't think to run it, Mike. Sorry about that. But... It's, it's a mild deficit. It has no impact on thinning. Now, at this timing, the leaf area is still limited compared to much later in the season, and so the amount of leaves sucking water out of the soil is limited. But we can get in years where it's a substantial deficit at the time, more when we get to the 10 to 12 millimeter stage, and in those cases, it can impact thinning. But I don't I should have run the model, but I don't think we would be at that stage yet at the petal fall timing to affect thinning. Terrence, if I could ask one more thing in regards to that. So we, we are in a deficit here. We have not experienced much rain. But in addition to being in a deficit, um, we have some blocks that just because of limited uh, uh, workers to be able to get out in the field because of the COVID, we have blocks that we have not had the ability to do much pruning on, so, they're, so they're, they're very dense. And I'm wondering if those trees are gonna thin easier because there is such a heavy canopy in those trees. Yeah, that answer is both good and bad, unfortunately. Um, when we haven't pruned, the bud load is often way too high. And so we do get more thinning, but it's never enough. And so the unfortunate result of this 18 year study is when we start with a lot of flowers, yeah, we get more thinning, but we still end up with way too many fruits and we can't get enough off no matter what we throw at them. And that's one of the reasons why we push precision pruning to get the bud number down so that we can get a reasonable thinning job. Now, I understand the challenges this year, but it's just a fact. Well, you have way too many flowers on those trees and you won't get the thinning you want. So you hope they thin easier, but you won't get enough fruit off no matter what you do. It's really difficult to manage Honeycrisp when they have too many flowers as they almost always go biannual. Okay, Pri primarily the, 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 the trees that have not yet been pruned are Empires and Macintosh, so. Have you had no damage on Empire, Will? Very little. We're seeing some damage on Macintosh, but very little on Empires. And it's a shame because those things could be gone and be a <laughs> wonderful thing. <laughs> you might have the best Empire crop in the state. <laughs> But in any case, yeah, with those varieties, the biennial bearing issue is not quite so difficult. But we did our study with uh, Macintosh, and we always ended up with more Macs and smaller fruit size when they were unpruned and too many flower buds, okay. even when we thinned aggressive. Okay. Thank now, you. we never came back and hand thinned, so you still have that option. We just did our chemicals to look at the final result. Right. So you'll be able to fix some things through hand thinning. Okay. <clears throat> 
Terence, I have a question in regards to uh, something to, that follows up on Will's question. Um, so the, 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 the spray that you mentioned now for defruiting the trees, the young honey crisps for 64 fluid ounces per hundred of max cell and pint of carburel and pint of oil. Did you, would you apply that at petal fall or when exactly? The best time is to 200 degree day to 250. That's when it's the most potent. I should have mentioned that, sorry. Yeah, okay, that's fine. So and then uh, what about uh, the people who have red tail blooms on the young uh, planted orchards, um, if they wanna go and uh, get the flowers off, the, off of them and they don't have the work power to do it by hand? See, that's a real problem because we can knock those fruits off when they get to seven or eight millimeter, but if we wanna knock the flowers off to prevent fire blight, we can't seem to knock them off. You can come back in and spray ATS on that rat tail bloom and I think kill a lot of those flowers. Assuming that uh, you're past the time toward normal thinning, you can still accomplish it uh, without much risk of phyto to the fruit itself. You will get some leaf phyto. Sure, and then what would be the ATS rate at that time? That would be a two and a half percent for two and a half gallons per hundred. Now that's something I wish for both you and me, uh, Surgeon, is that we had a great method to get rid of rat tail bloom. Yeah. Because it's a serious fire blight issue. Yeah. I, I have some people who have cider varieties that, that started blooming too late anyhow, because they, if they are just newly planted and they want to just get loose all of the flowers and, you know, it's a tough one. Well, I tell you, I have terrible experience with European cider varieties that bloom late. I could never keep fire blight out of them because of that same issue you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. It'd be difficult. Are there any other questions for Terrence? Um, I, I do have one more for you, Terrence. Uh, the thoughts on uh, something Maxell plus seven as opposed to NAA on Gala at petal fall timing. That's a great question. I should have thought to put, make my comment about it. We sprayed on this 18 year study, Maxell 7 every year. And on the cool years, we didn't get very much, but on a warm year, it worked beautifully. So if there's any year to put on Maxell 7 at Petal Fall, this is the year. I think you'll have great response on Gala and it really helps with fruit size. I should have said that, but forgot. A follow up to that. Over. Go ahead, Dan. Well, a follow up to that is this. It's very safe at petal fall. So a full rate of Maxell, 100 parts per million, doesn't over thin, but it works to improve thinning and fruit size when applied in a warm year. On cold years, it just is like wasting your money. Terrence, I have a question. Um, the, the, the primary thing that I found unusual about the season so far this year is uh, how uh, when we entered silver tip in, in early April, I thought we were going to be about two weeks ahead of our traditional schedule. By the time we got to blossom, we were at least a week, if not 10 days later than that, uh, than that traditional window. And I don't know if that has any kind of a consideration in terms of carbohydrate de deficit in the trees. It does. So also in this 18-year study, we tried to correlate the number of degree days between green tip and bloom. Ours was really cool. You know, we, we green tip was early all over the state and then it took forever to get to bloom. And the tree is just churning up carbohydrates the whole time. That's why that graph that I showed from, from Peru has never been positive since green tip, an extremely long period of using up carbohydrates. So it does impact the initial sort of strength of the flowers and whether or not the ovule is uh, healthy enough to be around, to be fertilized. But when we got to bloom, temperatures were so awesome and bee activity was so good, I'm expecting them to be pollinated well. We found that once we get past bloom, the tree is not really dependent on reserves. It's dependent on the daily new photosynthesis from the leaves. So it would have been a negative thing if we'd have had sort of a really cool bloom period of not much bees flying and we'd have had many ovules die before they were fertilized. But since it didn't happen that way, I think it's not gonna have any big impact on us. We had wonderful pollination and I think everything got fertilized within 
well, with the pollen tube growth model, we saw that when we put in a certain bloom date, and the temperatures gave us, you got to spray ATS like 24 hours later, 36 hours later, because we had great temperatures. So I think that we've got good initial set, and now we're dependent on the daily amount of carbon produced by the leaves, and that's where the carbon model helps us in deciding how much thinning. So I don't think it's going to thin real easy. I think it'll be great thinning this Saturday, Friday, Monday, Sunday, depending on where you are, because of pretty decent temperatures. It'll be a perfect year to do petal fall thinning. It's a long answer. I don't know if it answered your question, Dan. <coughs> it it's is an odd year, though. I've never seen that long a period between green tip and bloom. Aaron, and, you, you, you keep referencing petal fall. We, we're pretty much in petal fall now. Most of our blossoms have come mm -hmm. off. But our kings are already probably, I've measured them today, six millimeters, seven millimeters. So I was shooting for a Saturday to, to start getting some thinner on. Uh, so would you consider that petal fall? Or at that time, we're probably going to be in that eight to 10 millimeter range. Yeah, so, well, I've tried to change slightly our normal strategy. That's why I like this degree day accumulation that the carbohydrate model tells you. And I wish I had run a site near you in Vermont that has a weather station. Because if you're, you're probably already in the window that we call petal fall of 100 to 125 degree days, and so you should be spraying today or tomorrow. Then I like to have almost a week to wait till we get to 12 millimeter to put on the next spray so we can judge what we get out of this uh, thinning spray at five to six millimeters. If you're six millimeters, you know, you're at the stage where you should put on your petal fall thinning spray today. Maybe you've already done it. I don't know. No, we haven't. We have not put anything on yet. Just because we, we do have we, we have lost some of our kings. We we've got some frost damage on some blocks, and I was just a little leery about putting anything on too too early, just until I was able to assess it a little better. Well, that's understandable if you're worried about something. But if you have a strong crop, it would be beautiful to go in right now at this timing with the petal fall spray, and then wait till they get to 12 millimeters when you assess whether you come back, because you may be able to do everything right now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, Mike, I took much longer than I probably should have, but. No problem. Great to you guys and talking. Thank you very much, Terrence. Appreciate it. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and we'll introduce our next speaker, Peter Yench from the Hudson Valley Lab. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everybody. Glad to be with you today. Uh, we've got a nice warm day here in the Hudson Valley and really challenged with a lot of our, our thinning. And with that, I'll share my screen and um, just touch on, on a little bit of the weather with regards to Peru from what I can tell from, from mid Hudson Valley. So from what I can see in Peru, uh, in April, you guys had about an inch and a half of rain. And then through the month of May, which we're only a few days out from completing the month, only uh, about 0.8 inches. So total of, you know, almost three inches, which is probably less than half of what you typically would get. So with regards to insects, insects really like dry weather. They tend to do really well when the weather is uh, warm and when it's dry. Just like anything else, plants in particular, and surgeon will press on that in a minute. Um, insects do get diseases. There's entomophagous fungi that attack insects, and those are biological controls for the, the pest complex that, that we sometimes utilize. But I just wanted to point out here in this slide that the rain that, that you guys are going to be getting in, in the very near future, coming up on Wednesday, is only 0 0.06 or 8 inches of rain. And then as we move into the, the next few days, the rain again, so we're going to be very light. So light rain, a lot of the growers that I talked to when I first started working here, they call it weed rain, just enough to grow the weeds and really not enough to, to provide moisture for, uh, for the trees. So the challenge with, um, with insect pest management when we have these kinds of rains, it's, it's just enough to keep the neonics, if we use them, to be absorbed into the tree. And for a lot of the residual insecticides, the older classes, pyrethroids, carbamates, 
and uh, organophosphates to really hold well. So with light rain, you get redistribution, but if it never sticks, it can't really red redistrib redistribute. So that's gonna be our challenge for insect pest management. Given the drought that we've had uh, in the North Country, we've seen it in the Hudson Valley. So <clears throat> many of you are familiar uh, with this insect. The, the black stem borer is an ambrosia beetle. It's, a, it's in the, the group Coleoptera. It can be attracted by uh, ethanol traps. When trees go to get into to a stress condition, and that can occur two ways. One, if we have heavy flooding in heavy soils, so heavy clay soils, long periods of rain, uh, the trees begin to um, lose their ability to metabolize effectively, and they begin producing ethanol. The, the beetle is attracted to the ethanol, not always along the edge. And the, the pictures of these trees here are, are in the middle of probably a, a 30 acre block of newly planted trees, beautiful um, Guilford Gala. And uh, you can see that these trees were impacted last season. So they're, uh, they're runting out, they're flowering, but they're really not producing foliage. And on a number of the trees, you'll see these bleeding sites. So that's the center tree. Where there was infestation last season, that hole never healed up. And so whether it be from the fungus that the ambrosia beetle brings into the galleries or some other function, those holes stay open. And so when you get tuber pressure up from the roots, it starts to bleed. So as I walked through this block, there were, you know, two trees here, three trees here. I'd skip a few more trees. It was on the knoll of a very shaly block. So you can see the shale at the base of that tree. As you move down the block toward the downhill side of it, um, the shale gets lighter and the soils get heavier and there was no infestation. So this infestation was brought about solely by the lack of rain. And even though you see the irrigation lines, the irrigation lines at the top of the hill were probably compromised in some way, shape or form, or they just didn't get enough water. The, sh the shale soils just can't hold enough to support the trees. So any place this season that you've had infestations last year and you begin to see these bleeding sites, I would encourage you to take a couple of minutes, get off the tractor and carve into the trees to see if you find these uh, two millimeter size holes. This, this insect is, is uh, one of the few insects that'll just kill the tree outright in years one and two. So these are um, four year old, three, four year old trees and um, they're in serious decline. So if you have newly planted trees, they tend to be more susceptible. We don't manage them as intensively as we do with the trees that produce crops. And so they're, they're much more susceptible. You can see here, these two trees are side by side. Again, heavy shale soil, but that distinctive wet area on the trunk. Uh, the next, tree, next insect that, that we're beginning to see in the Hudson Valley that's of concern to the North Country is Plum Curculio. We went probably two weeks uh, or at least uh, 12 days before we saw our first feeding or overpositional site. So that was, um, Yesterday morning, I went out and found the first set. However, it was one cluster along the edge in our untreated trees. We have not seen any curculio injury in our treated trees, which one would expect, but given the fact that these are untreated, one cluster in hundreds that I looked at show that the plump curculio, even though they're present, are in really low numbers. So as an entomologist, and I make my living off of pests, I got a little concerned <laughs> that the populations are in decline. So I called my colleague from North Carolina State, Jim Waldenbach. He's about three or four weeks ahead of us. And I said, Jim, you know, we're seeing really low numbers of curculio. What are you guys seeing in North Carolina? He said, Peter, I've, I've worked in this for 30 years. This is the, the year where we've seen the lowest injury from plump, plump curculio in our um, efficacy studies that we run. He only had 2% injury in his untreated controls. Now, we got somebody in North Carolina, got somebody in the Hudson Valley. Does that mean that that's going to necessarily uh, play a role in Peru? It's anybody's guess. But it does seem like this season, Plum Curculio along the East Coast here, up through uh, New Jersey and North, uh, they're just really not seeing Plum Curculio the way we typically see it in most years. Um, 
again, with, with this insect, whole orchard sprays are typically what we do with uh, uh, numerous insecticides, including um, everything from Avant, which is relatively uh, user-friendly material, does a, does a really nice job controlling Plunkoculio as well as the LEP complex, and uh, things like uh, Actara, which really only controls um, the insects in the foliage as well as curculio. So we'll move into that in a minute. The third insect on our radar in the Hudson Valley is, is Kali moth. We did see very robust flights, very high numbers this season. And depending on where you are as you move north from Albany, uh, Kali moth can be a real problem. Dan, uh, I know you're, you're right there on my screen, so I thought I would ask you a quick question. In your cider variety blocks, is uh, Kali moth a yearly issue for you? Um, I, 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 I've only had, um, light crops there, so I'm not really seeing it yet. Okay. Cause it's, it's an insect that as you move further north, we, um, we sometimes see it go into decline as, as we move north of Albany. Um, and I, I scouted and trapped for it up in Peru and really didn't see high levels of, of Kalima. So it is huge problem in the Hudson Valley. Um, with regards to some of the other insects that we have to contend with in the North Country, rosy apple aphids um, frequently show up. Uh, it's not a huge economic pest, but nonetheless, it, it does cause problems with clusters. And so the use of a neonic like Actara for Plum Curculio will control rosy apple aphids quite well. Any of the other neonics, and we seem to be, uh, have been using them quite a bit, uh, things like imidacloprid or um, used to be called Provado, it's now Admire Pro, uh, does a great job of taking care of the aphids, including rosy apple aphid. And it, its application at petal fall, once the leaves begin to curl up, um, is an ideal fit. The lepidopterin complex, especially the green fruit worm, are always a problem. Um, being out now examining flower clusters to determine whether or not during the bloom period, uh, if you still have late bloomers, putting in a BT product to reduce the amount of feeding that you see on, on clusters of fruits, probably a good idea. And then in those places where coddling moth is a problem, putting out mating disruption or at least setting traps to see what you have, this would be the ideal time. It's probably anywhere from um, a week, 10 days, maybe two weeks, depending on the weather, uh, before coddling moth begins to fly further north. The biggest problem that Jim brought to my attention down in North Carolina and what we're seeing in the Hudson Valley are ligus pests, the plant bug complex, so that includes tarnished plant bug, but there are a number of others that during drought in particular, especially as the temperatures warm up, they're gonna move from broadleaf weeds into, uh, into fruit. Cider varieties may not be that big of a problem, but certainly other varieties uh, for wholesale and direct sales can be uh, damaged considerably by plant bug. You can apply belief, um, during periods of time where the bees aren't flying. It's a, it's a decent material, um, relatively safe overall compared to everything else for bees. However, if you uh, have continued problems with tarnished plant bug, really the only thing that works um, that has residual are the pyrethroids. So from petal fall all the way through to second cover, plant bug can be a real issue in those varieties that, that you tend to see them in year after year. Um, the use of the premix materials like Endigo, which combines thiamethoxan and lambda cyhalothrin that you'd use for plum curculio, would be a good fit to also try to control uh, the, the plant bug complex. And as I move down the list, the dogwood borer, at this point in time, we really need to be considering transition away from Lohr's band and into uh, mating disruption. So in the North Country, all the way up to the Canadian border, dogwood borer has been a perennial problem. Uh, the twin ties at 200 per acre per year um, for, the, for year one is, uh, is an excellent way to go. It's been proven to be as or more effective than the use of Lohr's band. And then with every passing year, you can reduce those to 150 or even 100 to the acre and get really great control. The reason you can do that with this clear wing moth is because its range of flight is relatively short. So if it's infesting a tree in the center of the orchard, it's only going to move a few meters from that tree to then reinfest the tree adjacent to it. By putting the mating disruption out, you flood the area with uh, the pheromone 
and it cannot find its mate and you can shut down the endemic populations. So then as you move through the seasons, you're really focusing on the perimeters to try to control dogwood borer. And it's just a, an excellent means by which to control the insect. It does take a little more time. Uh, Trace has approached us over the last two years to work with a mating disruption product in which you're only applying 32 ties to the acre and it cuts the time down uh, dramatically. So we've been looking at that uh, last year, did a great job with looking at it again this year. It looks to be an excellent solution for the time consumption for the 200 uh, twin ties per acre. So to me, this is, um, this is sort of the crux of, of what we need to get a handle on and that is the premixes. So the majority of these, except for Minecto Pro, will control Plum Curculio. Uh, some of them, like Agriflex, have thiamethoxan, which is the ingredient, in Actara. and Actara. You can see a lot of them have thiamethoxan or a pyrethroid to try to control Plum Curculio. So when you're making your decisions on these, if Codling Moth is not a big deal, then thiamethoxan, Actara, can be used for petal fall and first cover. However, in the southern regions where Codling Moth is a big problem, then the use, if you go with a premix, going with something that has cyantranilaprol, which is the active ingredient in Octara. So Volium Flexly there on the bottom controls Plum Curculio really well with chlorantranilaprol, the, the Altacor portion of that, and the Octara portion of that. However, the thiamethoxan rate typically a little lower, and so you'll have to do some math to adjust the thiamethoxan up to that 5.5 um, ounces to the acre for Octara that you typically use. So with that said, collie moth mating disruption uh, does work, work fairly well with the isomate ties. However, some of the other ties that, that have been uh, researched are, are only providing moderate levels of control. When we've used isomate along with SIDEX in an organic planting system, that provided really good control of collie moth season long. The problem with the isomate obviously is the time and the number per acre. But up north, you still have a week or two before you need to get these out. You have to get them out before the adults fly. The SIDEX is applied at first hatch and then multiple applications at relatively you know, moderate to lower doses over uh, the course of emergence. So that's sometimes three or four applications. But in one block back in uh, 2012, I believe, we applied that combination of thermal mating disruption and SIDEX in a block that had 75% collie moth damage uh, at the end of the previous year. And it just cleaned up that block. Now, it's not textbook. It might have been uh, a situation that was very unique. But nonetheless, it does show the power of SIDEX as a biocontrol agent along with mating disruption in an organic system, especially in high density systems where it's very tight spacing and uh, a lot of trees to the acre. It seems to work really well in that scenario. Um, you know, the use of other, other materials for collie moth, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot more time with. Uh, they're fairly clear. In the Hudson Valley, if you have uh, collie moth populations that are perennial, going with Altacor or the <clears throat> Cyantranilaprol at the first generation, two applications back to back, is what we're recommending at this point. If you choose to use something like Ryman, which is an insect growth regulator, you need to put that on at 50 degree days after the first flight. So it's about four or five days after first flight. You lay that on, they lay their eggs over top of the Ryman and that provides the best results. It does provide really high levels of mortality of those emerging uh, larvae. Exaril is a fairly new pro uh, product it's the, uh, the next generation up from Altacor, Cyantranilaprol, um, and it, it also has Plum Curculio activity. There's even a newer product out uh, in that same group, uh, Cyclanilaprol, which has PC activity that rivals any of the other Plum Curculio materials. Really good LEP material, uh, much more broad spectrum uh, than the others. So for Plum Curculio, again, the Actara, if we use it for PC, it has no LEP control. If we want to maintain our lepidopterin complex in our research trials, we use Actara to control Plum Curculio, and then we can see what kind of levels of, of collie moth and other LEPs we have. Um, Avant, just underneath that, is, 
is really good at controlling LEPs as well as Plum Curculio. And I mentioned the Exaril, a uh, good combination material. Um, Besiege and Volume Flexi, also the pre-mixed materials, work both against Plum Curculio and the LEP complex. So there's, there's no shortage of materials. The problem we run into, and this is something that, um, you know, I've worked on 20 years ago with the phytoseed mites, particularly uh, Tiflodromus pyri. If you want to conserve that, uh, that biocontrol agent and does a great job of reducing European red mite, you really can't afford to apply any pyrethroids at all or manzate for that matter. Three applications of manzate basically cuts the population down to a fraction of what it was. So the challenge we have with trying to maintain um, phytoseeds in the orchard is both the fungicides we use as well as the insecticides. So I just wanted to touch really quickly on some basics on bees. Uh, they fall into four basic categories with regards to pesticide impact on bees. And there are some materials you can use that are not hazardous to bees at any time. Uh, they fall into this class four. I just want to touch on a few of those. As I mentioned, Altacor, which is the chlorantronilaprol. Uh, if mites are a huge problem, Apollo. And, and all these listed here have relatively no impact directly to bees. Now, devil's in the details. There's probably a lot behind that. We really don't want to get into applying insecticides unless we're really up against the ropes. However, in years when we have really high temperatures and a broad spectrum of bloom from pink to petal fall, there may be a situation where we get into where we need to control a lepidopterin, let's say, that's, that's really taken over the crop. Bacillus thuringiensis is really the way to go for everything but collie moth, for oblique banded leaf roller, oriental fruit moth, red banded leaf roller, sparganosis, and so on, that would be the go-to material if LEPs are a problem. And you could, fairly, you could be fairly assured that, that that's not gonna have an impact on bees. So I'm kind of out on the limb when I, when I move in that direction. But uh, if you're really up against the ropes, granulosis virus again uh, for collie moth in situations well, it wouldn't necessarily hold true unless you've got pollinators or pollination going outside of, of your apple crop, like in, uh, uh, in dandelions and such. So with that, Mike, I'm not going to get into anything else. We are still planting trees in the Hudson Valley. We're still in, in some blocks, still in bloom. And uh, the weather right now is just gorgeous. So thank you for your attention. And I don't imagine I have even a minute for questions, but be happy to take any if there are some. Thank you, Peter. Uh, if anybody has a question, uh, feel free to jump in. We do have one, and maybe this is for both you and Terrence. Um, using seven at the five to six millimeter impact on bees, uh, your thoughts on that? So I'll start with the impact on bees. Um, there are different formulations. The WP formulation has a larger particle size than the XLR or, or than the 4L. And so that larger particle size appeared to have greater impact on the colony, especially on brood. The, uh, the liquid formulations seem to have a lower impact. Either way, they're gonna have an impact on bees. Um, and there's really no getting around that with carbaryl. Um, it's an important thinner and it has a, a, a very specific role in, in uh, the, the kind of thinning that's likely to be needed up in the North Country this season. So I'll hand that over to Terrence. Thank you. Terrence, any other thoughts on, on seven at, at the five to six millimeter timing and its impact on bees? Uh, I, hope, I hope all the bees will be out of the orchard by that timing. I hate to spray while bees are still in the orchard. But so certainly the XLR formulation is less toxic to bees. We'll spray it when they're in the hive and let it dry so they can't pick it up. The problem with the wettable powder is they can pick up those granules and haul it back to the hive. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Peter before we move into our next presentation? All right, well, I thank you, Peter. And next we'll hand it over to Dr. Surgeon Asimovich. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm gonna talk about the uh, status of the diseases and of course, you know, spend most of the time talking about the uh, fire blade. And uh, so I'm going to just briefly go through the scab because there's nothing really too much to write about home about this. 
um, you know, it's uh, I just uh, posted out here um, in two boxes highlighted two infection periods, and that were really worth the, the were the most worth to spray for. Okay, and I know that a lot of people started spraying earlier, and that's understandable because we had weather forecast, um, you know, lollygag with us all the time that there's going to be infection, and then it just turns out it's not. But these these May 15th. Okay, in May 28th, which we are going to expect come in, are you know so far the two major scab infection periods, and this is uh, this is what the new one is showing, and these other ones that were uh, labeled there March 20th, March 29th, and April 2nd were not you know really the scab infection periods that warranted a spray, from two for two reasons. First, we did not come to the point of a pink a bud from which we expect major ascospore releases at that time. Usually that's, uh, that's when uh, ASCO spore releases really coincide with the tree phenology. So, and this is what really basically, this is how the scab season looked like so far in, the, in, in Peru. Okay, it might be slightly different down there where Hugh Gunnison is and then Will, but um, this is overall the way, you know, in this purple big rectangle that I'm showing here, in the middle of this chart graph, you can see these white humps at the bottom that basically show ASCO spore releases but they're not the infections uh, because they don't have this red line that is gonna go and skyrocket above 100 or 300. So, so uh, basically up until uh, uh, the, you know, the 15th of May, we did not have a major scab infection period. And even this infection that happened on May 15th here that you see after the rectangle on the right side, that one was not uh, really warranting a fungicide spray uh, if you are in a, or in an or if you have an orchard or a farm that did not have scab uh, symptoms last year in your orchard, so you might as well have been not spraying anything up until that point. However, one thing that really changed is that we entered pink uh, pink bud stage at that moment. So from pink bud up until petal fall, we view these infections that go just above as significant. Um, you know, even for the orchards that were. That were uh, they were clean from last year. So so basically, the rule that uh, Rimpro really imposes on us that you don't have to spray for this one is not actually true because you actually have to. Because from that point on, um, you know we we uh, expect uh, major issues if if the uh, coverage is not provided. You know from pink to to petal fall. So then the, the 15th May would warrant the first uh, scab spray of the season in Champlain Lake Valley, and then nothing uh, from that point on. You know, there's nothing happening up until the prediction that I just got, you know, uh, put posted here yesterday on the 28th or 29th uh, of, um, of uh, May, we we're expecting a major uh, scab infection period. So nothing really, you know, tough to write home about, except that, uh, you know, if I would compare uh, one uh, after, you know, like one region to another, you know, you guys definitely uh, are, you know, much in a better shape because of that dry period that Peter mentioned. So you are definitely drier uh, than, you know, you're definitely drier than, than we are uh, here. And, uh, you know, what I would mention is that, you know, that's good and bad in, you know, in certain cases. It's, it's not so great for scab because, you know, the lack of uh, leaf wetness for scab is definitely something that, you know, doesn't allow the pathogen to, to uh, germinate and infect. And that's the reason why you see those white humps for scab infections. There was just too cold and too dry at the beginning. But now we're catching up with this warmth, and of course, the fire blood is the big issue. Okay, and uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, you know that in a little bit. But I just want to summarize one more thing before we go. You know, I'm going to post this handout for you on the web on my uh, blog page. And I wanted to say to you that basically we did detect mature spores in. Uh, Champlain Lake Valley on April 2nd, and we advised you to, we advise you to go and change the, uh, uh, the biofix state in RIMPRO right, right about like 23rd, 24th March. And um, it seems that uh, what is really important is that, you know, you started very early with the green tip on uh, May, uh, somewhere between um, uh, April 7th to 12th, depending on which location Champlain Lake Valley you are. And in general, just, these two infection periods of 15th May and 28th, 29th May we're expecting, but there is just too much ascospores yet to be released. Uh, based on RIMPRO, we are ranging anywhere between 40 to 45% 40, uh, of ascospores uh, still remaining in the leaf litter to be uh, you know, uh, discharged. 
And that's going to be higher, of course, in Shea Z up to 45%, whereas in Peru, it's like around 40%. So definitely, we're just middle way towards, uh, you know, through, through the primary scab season. So uh, keep in mind when you're looking at the scab infection periods in NUA that this model is way too old to catch up to RIMPRO model at this point. So and you, you should trust more the maturity of the uh, maturity model that you see in, in uh, RIMPRO. And that's basically, uh, if, you, if I go back here, this is, the, this is the chart that you should look at that shows the uh, percentage of the ascospores that are still remaining in the leaf litter to mature and be released. So it's a maturation uh, chart there. So it's much more accurate. And the reason why I'm telling you that is because we, at, in Hudson Valley right now, we are, have been having a date that was reported to us uh, on uh, May 18th that the ascospores have been completely released out and the primary skip season is over which is not correct according to RIMPRO. So keep in mind that, the, that RIMPRO is having a much better model to predict that. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the prior blade and a lot of calls, a lot of questions of, about what you know, people should do at this time. Um, you know, um, and and um, one thing that I wanna just say is that I just chose here to show you the output when we actually entered the period of high EIP value, that was actually May 22nd. And this is for Peru. And um, that's from that point on, if there was any wetting coming in, we would you know, alarm the, the risks. And then on the right side, you see, can see here uh, of this first chart on, you know, on the left, on the right side, you can see May 26th and 27th, which shows that there's gonna be infection today and tomorrow, and there's gonna be infection on 28th as well. So this kept on sticking here even today. And you know the uh, EIP value skyrocketed uh, above uh, you know 200, which is very alarming. And one thing that really uh, is shocking is when you type in the strep date, which you can see on the right side here, on the right side of the of this uh, of this um, uh, row of, of two charts, you can see that you can knock down that EIP value to zero on that May 26th if you applied it, but the very next day you're coming back to a high value of EIP above 100 and the dew or rain uh, event that uh, warrants another streptomycin spray. So uh, in discussing with Will this morning, uh, a really a good option would be to just wait for 27th in the evening and you know mix regulate with streptomycin and spray in the evening of 27th to catch up for both infections 26th and 27th, which would be a good option to do so that you can uh, come out of this scenario uh, more easily. However, you know, I'm just gonna go and switch my slides and just show you one, one more thing here that I just uh, mentioned to you earlier. Um, I'm just gonna go and show you the, uh, how this uh, whole thing looks like for another location, okay? And that, this is not far away. So this is, uh, this is in uh, uh, Vermont, and this is what I was gonna show you, that if you do that um, uh, streptomycin spray on the 27th, and if you didn't add regulate, you would basically miss your infection on the 26th. So the infection stays there, meaning that it did establish because of the dew on the morning of the 26th. You applied your strep without regulate on the 27th, you didn't catch up for the, uh, for the, for the uh, 24 hour you know, infection that happened before that. And you're still battling against the infection on the 28th. It just doesn't want to disappear because the, the conditions are so favorable and there's a, a dew that is predicted that is going to trigger the infection. And you know, at this point, you know, I, I, if if you want to stick to the uh, to using just uh, streptomycin uh, without regulate, um, you would have to spray back to back, you know, two or three days to just go out of this this uh, nightmare of of infections that we're gonna we're gonna go through. Uh, granted, one thing that it's not visible in this model right now is that the relative humidity hours are not at the huge number above 90% relative humidity. So that's, that's definitely something that I'm happy about, okay? Because we have a recipe for disaster when this happens, okay? But in your mind, I would like you to think that rain equals dew. Any of those two can, is a wedding event and can cause the infection. You know, uh, you can even, you can spray less than 50 gallons of water per acre uh, from your sprayer and you can get, you know, a fire blight to, to activate and allow infection to happen. So whatever you spray, I would add strep um, in, in, in any case. But we do have this, you know, on the, uh, several locations, we have an hour of relative humidity above 90% here. 
But you know, we can go on discussing whether this is going to whether these infections are going to happen or not. But at this point, there's a cluster of three infections in two models, including RIMPRO, mentioning there's going to be infections happening sometime during these three days. So that's really alarming because, as uh, uh, Terence mentioned, you know, there's people in the Crown Point uh, just getting to that sweet spot right now to to apply their thinners. And there's a lot of discussion what to do and what not to do. Um, if you know you go out of that range of five to six millimeters, you know, should you do it or shouldn't you do it? So um, you know, there's there's options, and definitely the option is to spray back-to-back -back streptomycin, um, you know, without regulate and uh, do it, you know, on the 26th and 27th. Just let's hope that the weather forecast changes for the 28th and the infection is not there. So I would do a spray on the 26th and 27th back to back on anything that has open flowers. And if you wish to apply thinner because it's that sweet spot, just do it. Um, so that's what I would do in that case. And just uh, skip adding regulate. Um, and because you need to do the thinning um, and to just to get that, you know, extra crop off. So, so in this, uh, I'm going back to the uh, handout that I posted there. Um, you know, play with this model and, you know, it, typing in the streptomycin spray date, which is at the bottom of this table here, I would warmly recommend you to go in and type in when you want to spray. If you decide not to add regularly to your strep, keep in mind that the very next day, if the model still reports infection, you have to go out again and protect the flowers that keep, they're going to open from the 26th into the 27th as well. So, and this is just another, uh, um, you know, proof here that I'm showing. This is an output from, RIMP from RIMPRO model that also shows there's going to be a cluster of infections happening in the next three days. So there's not only the mirror light model that is incorporated in your NUA as that EIP value, but there's another model also reporting there's going to be three to four infections coming ahead of us. And these curves down here that you see at the bottom of this graph, the red line curved curves, uh, those are the populations of bacteria that grow on groups of flowers. So each of those curved lines is a group of flowers that has been contaminated with the fireblade bacterium. And they are quite steep. You know, you see uh, that basically these lines go and reach the, the critical level when it, when it enters these, these orange fields. It reaches these critical levels in a very short amount of time. So basically less than, uh, than 48 hours or at best at 48 hours. So when this happens, we know that there is a recipe for disaster. And this is very, very similar, if not even stronger, uh, well, I would say more dangerous than what we had in 2016 at the end of May. Because the, uh, what the, in 2016 happened was there was a mild infection that happened on 21st May. Then there were two infections that ensued on 29th and 30th May. And there was uh, a very uh, small amount of rain and do events and a little bit of hail. So you really don't need much rain or dew to allow the infections to happen. So um, in the uh, Peru and Shazi region, uh, where at this point, you know, there's a lot of blooms open, uh, don't hesitate to cover really well if you want to, uh, you know, if you want to protect against fire blade. And if you do use Regulate, uh, keep in mind that you have 24 hours kickback activity if, if you mix streptomycin with Regulate. So you could, you know, catch up today's infection tomorrow if you apply, um, you know, streptomycin for the infection that is going to happen tomorrow as well. And then look what's going to happen uh, for the infection on the 28th, because that's another, you know, um, EIP value that just cannot be annulled with the application of the streptomycin. So it's a tough one, okay? And, but you know, we can definitely get through it. I'm, I'm confident in that. And if you have any questions, you can just uh, shoot them out and we can discuss them. Terrence is here as well and we can, we can uh, talk about it. But one thing that I wanna just make clear, okay? And because that has been a point of discussion for the last five years that I've been here. The question is, if I use Regulate or LA700 and mix it with Strep, whether you know your strep is going to get into the unopened flowers the answer is no it's not so with this heat any contingents uh, any groups of flowers that open after your spray and you open the next day you know or the, within 24 hours up until the you know tomorrow they're going to be unprotected and they do stand the chance of being contaminated uh, quickly with the bacterium because the bees are active 
And also uh, at this time of the year, uh, there's just definitely some active cankers providing an inoculum that can jump very easily to the flowers. So you, you should uh, definitely keep in mind that inoculum is there. You know, once you get fire blight, it's gonna be there for decades in those cankers. You don't get rid of it that easily. So you should definitely think that fire blight is there, just lurking and waiting from those cankers to just jump to the flowers. And then from that point on, the bees can, uh, you know, transfer it or the rain or the, you know, or, uh, you know, aerosol uh, from, from, uh, from wetting can, can spread it around. So in this specific case, um, you know, there we have two models yelling at us that there's going to be infections. And, you know, definitely, um, you, know, it, you know, you have to cover for all three days somehow, either applying with a kickback tomorrow and then going back again on 28th. Uh, or you can just do back-to-back, -back, um, you know, 26 spray, 27 spray with streptomycin without regulate, and then hope for the best that uh, infection on 28th is going to disappear because weather forecast is going to change. So this is, it. this is the way how we stand now. I know that there is a lot of uh, concern about the uh, lack of workforce and in, in inability to go and cover everything uh, very quickly, and I'm aware, you know, well aware, aware of that. So what I would do in your case um, you know, for all the blocks that are younger than eight years, you should start spraying any open flowers on those first. Then you should go and switch to your older orchards, okay? And then also all your, all your galas, New York 1, New York 2, all highly susceptible varieties, you cover them first. And you also do that and you cover them, uh, uh, even the mature orchards, you should cover the most susceptible varieties first. And then you can go and do the other ones that are maybe just beginning at a petal fall, or at full petal fall, and you know, and cover those red tail blooms. Keep in mind that in 2016, we were at petal fall, full scale blown petal fall. And there was certain percentage of flowers, maybe it was in the range of three to 5%, but it allowed uh, the, the, the uh, infection to be propelled to uh, you know, unprecedented levels. You remember that, how bad that was. So, so even three to 5% of flowers, left open and, and or as red tails is going to be enough to support the populations at that time to reach damaging levels. So, uh, so at this point, I'm going to just, just stop and, you know, open it for questions. And then, you know, Terrence and I can just go and discuss what are, what are your options for each, each of you individually. All right. Great. Thank you, Surgeon. Uh, does anybody want to uh, start with their questions? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself or Type them in the chat box. So, surgeon, let me pose this uh, uh, dilemma to you. People sprayed ATS on Monday. Sure. And I suggested they wait till Tuesday to spray strep 24 hours later. So, suppose yeah. they spray it on Tuesday. Um, that you say you have to come back on Thursday with back to back streps? No, they would have to come back on Wednesday again. But back to back again? Yes. Yes, because there's just, there's, there's definitely groups of flowers that are rapidly opening between the 26th and 27th. That's what the model is saying. So this is what I was showing in this specific case here. So let me just go and delete the date of bloom here. And let me show you how, that, how the model looks like right now. Okay, so this is, this is, for, this is uh, similar to Crown Point right now. And this is very similar to all the locations in, uh, in Peru as well. So this is how the prediction looks like, 26th, 27th, and 28th. We're in, in extreme levels of, uh, you know, population numbers on the stigma of the flowers, you know, above 200 EIP value. Okay, are you guys seeing my share? You still, are? okay, good, you are. So, so if I play with this spray date and I say, okay, let's just do the strap on the 26th. So I get that value reset to zero only on the 26th. The very next day, I get back to very high infection potential. And if you don't want to use regulate, you would have to go back to back, circumycin 26, circumycin 27. If you want to use regulate, you could come tomorrow, sometime 24 hour after uh, the uh, due that started on the 26th, and do regulate with streptomycin on the 27th. And you would be out of that ATS range, uh, Terrence, right? And then you would cover, so let's just, for the funsies, let's just do that and put the spray on the 27th. 
So knowing that you have the kickback activity with the regulate, you would cover for both infection 26 and 27. But then again, if the forecast stays the same, we again have infection on the 28th. So with each of these days, there is groups of flowers that open with the heat. And I am assuming that on 28th as well, if this stays the way how it is right now, uh, there's going to be leaf wetness predicted for six hours. There's going to be infection on the 28th as well. So, so then at best, you would have to do back to back. So on the 27th, you do regulate plus streptomycin. Then on the 28th, you do streptomycin alone. And for the rest of the season, if there's any other infections coming in, I would just completely back off of regulate. Not only because of the thinners, that we just, just know that the uh, streptomycin gets taken up in the leaves and there's damage, phytotoxic damage to the leaves because the regulate plus streptomycin. So, and uh, I'm gonna just show you for one, one more case here for Peru. Okay, um, let's just go back to New York. Let's just look at uh, Peru, one station in Peru. So, this is how it looks like for Peru, okay? There was uh, definitely a leaf wetness for an hour on 25th, 26th, and then it's predicted for 27th and 28th again. So, so this would be um, you know, definitely something that I would be very worried about because of the dew events that we're having, and there's a rain event happening on the May 27th. So, so the answer is yes, this is gonna be a unique situation in which you would have to do back-to-back -back at least two sprays in a row one would regulate plus streptomycin, the other one just streptomycin alone, at best. I think that might work then if we come in uh, later in the week uh, with this petal fall timing in the Champlain for Thursday through Saturday. Thursday and Friday are kind of warm. So if we went Friday or Saturday, it would be outside of the window of the... Yeah, 48 hours, yeah. So, so Will, you, you had that question and, and Terrence mentioned to you that you should uh, thin um, today or tomorrow. So, you, you know, if you want to do that, if you don't want to miss that five to uh, six millimeter, uh, you know, uh, size of the fruit to, uh, to do your petal fold thinning, just uh, back off on adding the Regulate and uh, do uh, consecutive sprays today and tomorrow and see what happens on 28th. So and then we can talk again. I was actually just discussing that uh, I'm probably going to put some thinner spray on tomorrow morning early. So I was going to do the thinner spray with the um, with the strep, but yes. leave the regulate out. I have a little. Are there any concerns with regulate and a lot of these newer varieties that that have higher higher risk of fire blight? We're concerned with fruit finish on the, with using regulate. Not if you don't have slow drying conditions. Um, you know, nothing that I see here indicates you're going to have slow drying conditions. Um, I have seen only damage from LA 700. Didn't test regulate, but I would assume it's similar. Only in years when you would have uh, slow drying conditions for extended periods of time. So I'm not really convinced that uh, that's going to be the case here because, you know, you're going to go, you know, with temperatures up to 80s. Yeah, it, it's going to have do during the evening or you know during the night, but I don't think it's going to stick for a long time. So if, if I were to come in tomorrow morning early, put on put on strep with a thinner spray, and then I was planning to put on a cover spray tomorrow night, put another shot of of strep on tomorrow night as well. Well, I this is what I would do. If I would use regulate. Yeah. Well, that's fine. Yeah. So if if you sprayed strep today on anything in bloom, that's you should have done that, okay? And you still have a chance to do it. Then go tomorrow again with strep, no regulate, okay? Just two back to back two sprays, okay? And then just wait to see what's going to happen on the twenty eighth. Okay. And if, if, I did, if if I did not get, a I I just lost you. Okay, you just go go. Uh, repeat one more time. If you didn't do what? Sorry, if I. We're, we're, we're going to be moving bees out of our orchard tonight. So today's kind of the question for me. So if I come in tomorrow morning mm -hmm. and spray, you would advise me to put regulate in to give me a kickback to today then? That's correct. Yes. All right. But in those cases, you know, I'm not, yeah. So I guess you were talking about the varieties that are in petal fall. So yeah, you're, you're talking about the varieties that are not in petal fall yet. So yes, you're right. Okay. Thank for you. any of the varieties that are not in petal fall, they're like still in bloom. That's, that's going to work, yes. Just go with Regulate tomorrow when you can, and it's going to kick back for the infection of today and for the infection tomorrow. Okay. 
Thank you. Yep. Uh, is there any kickback activity with strep without Regulate or LI 700? Do you get any a few hours? If you have dew and you go out at two hours after the dew hits, do you have any? No, no, there is not. No, that's why we're adding the, uh, the regulate because it just doesn't want to go into the tissue. You know, the, uh, the only carrier that I know is in streptomycin is the, uh, um, it's some kind of a milk product that they put inside and I'm pretty sure that they don't have a penetrant in the formulation inside. So, um, Definitely, definitely, you have to do either LA, LA 700 or regulate uh, to have the kickback activity. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Was that you, Jim? Yes, it was. And I'm well aware of the slides you're showing. I've been sure. staring at them a lot. Yeah, I um, so, yeah. so it's, it's, uh, it's a tough one, uh, but, um, you know, I have never seen something like this so far. Okay, uh, one thing that I am... Uh, how would I put it? I'm a little bit more confident with is the fact that, uh, that we just don't have an overlaid huge number of hours of relative humidity above 90%. Okay. Which makes me think that, um, that we're not going to have a disaster from the infection, but you know, we have three, four uh, days in a row in certain cases in certain locations of uh, uh, dew uh, or leaf wetness for whatever reason. And you know, at least two sprays are gonna ha have to go in. I just don't know how you wanna space them and where you wanna go. But um, you know, I would be much more worried if there was on top of all that, you know, a large number of hours with relative humidity above 90%. Yeah. So yeah. Well, so I went out this morning with strep and sure. regulate. And because we had showers also at Shape and Orchard, didn't show up on the leaf wetness meter on the sure. weather station, but we had it yesterday afternoon. So I went out. So yes. I have no yeah. option for regulate at this point. What yeah. I was thinking of doing before this meeting was going out with strep and just going through the susceptible varieties and the varieties that are still opening. Because sure. thankfully, the max are done you know there's yes. a lot of the varieties are pretty much done could there be one or two percent flowers not open yes i was choosing to believe that that wasn't going to be a major problem sure sure maybe sure. i should rethink that so i was going to spot yeah. spray with strep from here on out because we're yeah. moving through bloom very quickly yeah yeah that's that's uh, good to know that you're moving too quickly where very quickly but what you could do if you did the strep this morning, just wait out up until 28th, okay, and then do regulate and, you know, strep again, if this current weather forecast stays the same. So that would be two applications of regulate and strep, and that would be okay in terms of leaf yeah, growing? you know, just because I want to give you a breather on that 27th, okay, because you did one on the 26th, and I mean, right. you know, Two sprays could be fine still, okay? You might not get that leaf yelling as terribly, okay? Yeah. Uh, but I would go and do the rest of the strep sprays with regulate and, 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 uh, and, uh, and strep. So that, that, that's all you, can, you should do. Two okay. is enough with regulate. Right. Well, that would give me the breathing room for tomorrow. I wouldn't have to go out tomorrow. I could exactly. wait and, exactly. and yeah. have some kickback. All right, I can live with that. Yeah. Terrence, a quick question in regards to uh, if I come in tomorrow morning to put strep on, I don't have much regulate, but I've got the LI 700. If I combine that with a thinner at the same time, is the is the LI 700 going to change the the thinning activity at all? Yes, it increases dramatically the amount of NAA taken up, and you get much more thinning. So, I so, would, so, would you, so, so if I was figuring, say, putting 10 parts of NAA on, would you go down to five parts? Would you cut it in half? Or? No, I would go down to seven and a half. Okay. So this is generally a strategy that some people out west use. They use a lot of Regulate, and that's fine. But my concern this year is where we've had damage. I just worry that it's going to give unpredictable results. But uh, that's a decision you can make. But I would reduce the rate down to seven and a half. Okay. Or if you were at seven and a half, I would reduce it to five. Okay. If you put that LI 700 in. And if 
if I if I'm spraying say pink ladies which thin a little harder I usually come in with a full rate of max cell what would you do on the max cell in regards to to pulling the rate back so Maxell does not respond as much to regulate increasing the dose as uh, NA does. Okay. The reason is that Maxell already has a lot of surfactant in it. They won't tell us exactly what the surfactant is. It's a trade secret, but it's loaded with surfactant already. So the addition of regulate with Maxell doesn't make a lot of difference. Maxell will work quite well this year being warm temperatures. And so maybe that's an option where we need to put regulate in because of the strep to go with Maxell and 7. Generally, I like NA and 7 at Petal Fall, but might be the year to not use NA and use Maxell if you've got to put Regulate in with the strep. And if, and if I don't have the ability to get the, get the Regulate LI700? Yeah, LI700 would be the same. We tested both Regulate and LI700 and several other surfactants in the early days of Maxell. And the company took all that data and loaded preloaded it with uh, one of the surfactants. So I don't think additional surfactant will make a lot of difference. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right, if there aren't any more questions, I'm going to um, thank Surgeon for his presentation. I know this was a lot of material to take in, so we appreciate you walking us through these scenarios, Surgeon. Sure. With that, we'll turn it over to Donna Asimovich, and she's going to cover uh, sunburn control. And I will also just want to say before we get into Donna's presentation, I know it is after 530. Um, we will be recording the rest of this meeting. So if people do need to hop off, you know, they, they certainly can. Um, but if you would like to, I, I definitely recommend sticking around for the rest of the live presentations. But we will have this recording up later this week. And with that, I'll turn it over to Donna. Hello, everyone, again. Uh, so I'll try to be really brief on this since we we are a little late. Um, so I'll just shortly uh, cover um, the strategies I tested at uh, the station, at HVRL station, uh, the strategies for, for the sunburn protection. Uh, so as uh, you might know, the sunburn is a physiological uh, disorder uh, that is caused by excessive solar radiation and extreme temperature. Uh, and we, uh, in our orchard, see three types of uh, sunburn uh, symptoms, which are sunburn browning, sunburn necrosis, and uh, photooxidative uh, sunburn. Uh, first two types of sunburn are, are mainly caused by uh, temperature and uh, solar radiation. And the third one is uh, cause it, when the fruit which was grown in the shade uh, gets only exposed to the sun, the direct sunlight. Uh, and you can see the on this slide you can see the photos. Uh, first two uh, bottom, uh, first upper uh, pictures are sunburn browning, and the bottom uh, left is sunburn necrosis and sunburn uh, uh, photooxidative sunburn. So uh, for the uh, sunburn to occur, the critical uh, uh, temperature plays the critical role uh, in it. And you'll see uh, that um, the temperature rise above 86 uh, Fahrenheit uh, and, your sun, uh, and your fruits are directly exposed to the sun. Uh, there will be uh, more likely uh, to uh, get the sunburn symptoms. So here's how an average uh, year looked like. It was the 2019, uh, during which uh, we had uh, about uh, 20 days where our maximum daily temperature exceeds uh, 68 uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, during that year, we saw uh, 10 uh, to 15 percent uh, of sunburn damages, depending on the variety. Uh, however, uh, on, in the 2016, which was a year when we have uh, almost 40 days of the uh, maximum daily temperature, which was above uh, 86 Fahrenheit, we saw uh, almost 40% uh, of fruit that, were, that had any, some of the types of uh, sunburn damages. So during the last uh, five years, we have tested a couple of different strategies. Uh, and I would uh, mention among them uh, over the row netting, uh, over the tree netting or drape mats. Uh, we also uh, tried overhead irrigation. We tried a couple of products that would uh, produce uh, white powdery uh, 
layer on the fruit surface, uh, such as Prosciate, uh, Screen Duo, and Surround. And we also try another product that is uh, waxed uh, based. Uh, it's Rainox uh, Plus, uh, and uh, it's just uh, augment the natural waxes that occur in the uh, in the in the fruit. Uh, so among uh, all of those products, um, just let me, yeah, let's see, here the, here's the slide uh, with uh, all the products we, we tried uh, and the active ingredients uh, they, uh, they have uh, with the rate we tried uh, and uh, the timing uh, we spray uh, the products. Uh, what we usually uh, do is to um, apply uh, drape nets or set the over the top over the row uh, nets uh, right after the fruit set uh, and we would also tr uh, start our spray program uh, right after the uh, fruit set or a couple of weeks uh, uh, later uh, basically you would uh, try to aim uh, the day uh, when your temperature would maximum daily temperature would exceed uh, 86 uh, Fahrenheit uh, and if you see that in the forecast that is coming uh, you should apply your spray product uh, at least uh, one to three days earlier and then uh, you would uh, come later and reapply every uh, 10 days to two weeks it just depends on the amount of rain you receive so usually we uh, finish the year with a uh, approximately four to six uh, spray applications of different products. And when I compare all of them, uh, there's no perfect strategies. Uh, sometimes you get a perfect uh, solution for sunburn, uh, but you uh, impact your uh, fruit quality. So for example, drape nets, especially the ones in the dark color, uh, and over the uh, row netting uh, would uh, provide you with excellent sunburn protection protection uh, but on the other hand would really impact the color development and sugar accumulation. Uh, evaporative cooling uh, had uh, good success uh, together with uh, Rainox Plus. Uh, the same rate uh, I would say the, the surround and shade would, would, uh, would be at the same level of success uh, and we saw the, the worst results with the screen duo in terms of sunburn protection. So when I say um, when I mentioned the, the, the spray products, uh, they, are, uh, they don't impact uh, as much uh, the fruit quality as the, uh, as the nets. Uh, we, we get also good results uh, with the uh, white color uh, drape nets. And since this product uh, has been <clears throat> widely used in organic production uh, and can provide some uh, protection uh, against insects, uh, uh, besides that is a protection for the hail da damage, uh, so we try to uh, test it on the different varieties and see how uh, each of them uh, would respond to uh, white nets uh, in, uh, uh, on the different cultivars grown in Hudson uh, Valley region. Uh, so here are the okay here are the other uh, the uh, our um, varieties that has been tested, uh, among them Empire, Honeycrisp, New York 1, New York 2, Fuji, and Gala. And you can see that uh, just by eye, uh, you can see that uh, control and uh, ones that are covered with the nets, uh, in some, some cases would differ in, in the color, uh, in color development. So uh, on, in my next slide, I just sum up all uh, fruit uh, quality uh, parameters. Uh, and uh, I listed each of the varieties uh, and I would divide them in two uh, groups, ones that responded re really well to the white drape nets and the other ones that really didn't like white, uh, white nets on the top. So uh, Gela, uh, Fuji uh, and uh, New York 2 would be varieties that do not like <coughs> nets. Uh, nets would uh, uh, decrease either yield, uh, would reduce color, and would reduce uh, sugar uh, accumulation. On the other hand, you would have a Honeycrisp, New York One, and Empire that responded uh, really nicely uh, to white mats. Uh, in some cases, uh, the color and blush was even improved, such as in, in Europe 1. So this is just a summary uh, of our results. Uh, I'm, uh, I would gladly uh, uh, answer any of your questions, if there's any. 
All right, great. Thank you, Donna. Um, any questions for Donna? All right, well, with that, um, I'm going to thank you again, Donna. Um, and we're going to turn it over to Dan Donahue to discuss bitter pit suppression and prediction pre-harvest. Very good, thanks, Mike. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, very good. I'm out in the Gala Orchard measuring fruits. Uh, so I'm gonna leave the video off and keep my signal bandwidth low. I'll be quick about this. So let's start with what you can do at this point. Um, you know about the research to show that a single application of Apogee at pink six ounces uh, is effective. Uh, and I assume that uh, a lot of you have already done that. So now we move through uh, bloom and we get to petal fall. So the next question is calcium. And when is the best time to apply calcium? You know, our work in Eastern New York uh, indicates that let me put it this way. If you have five calcium sprays in your budget for this year for your Honeycrisp, I would apply them starting at petal fall and weekly. So five sprays weekly starting at petal fall. If you want to put more sprays on, then continue into the summer, stretch out your interval to 10 to 14 days. Uh, there are some people putting sprays on at bloom or as early as pink. I have no data to support that. Um, I, I don't think it's problematic. It's just more sprays and, and more money. As far as materials go, I don't particularly have a preference and I'm not sure it really makes any difference. Uh, historically, calcium chloride has always looked good. It's cheap, but it tears up your sprayers and it's tough when it gets hot out. It could be uh, cause some phyto. Uh, I've used a material called POMA, which is a 6% calcium chelate. And that was effective, um, but again, it's, it's really what your supplier has, what you're comfortable with. The AgriK company makes a product that is actually tank mix compatible with Apogee, which might be a consideration um, for you. Uh, I don't worry so much about the percent uh, uh, mineral analysis. The, the, the Poma product is 6% uh, calcium analysis. It sounds low but it seems to do the job. Okay, comment on Apogee post bloom. Uh, on Honeycrisp, I, I really don't like it in terms of bitter pit. However, it is very effective uh, fire for fire blight shoot blight suppression. And that's an important consideration. And for you guys, that might be really important this year. So. You know, that's, that's more important, especially for you, because your native bitter pit situation is quite mild. Last year in our validation study, which uh, 78 blocks around the state, uh, 20 of them in the Champlain Valley, overall, you experienced less than 4% bitter pit incidence as compared to 18% in the Hudson Valley and 16% in Western New York. So that's great, and I suspect it's due to your cold environment that really helps you out there. So you have more, I think you have more leeway uh, with this particular problem, which isn't to say there are a few blocks up there that, um, that do have some serious bitter pit issues, but many, many blocks that are actually quite low in bitter pit. Finally, no matter what we do, we can't totally eliminate it because there's some underlying problems with the apple. However, you can try to avoid the financial loss. And to do that, it would be great if we could pre-harvest sample blocks and develop a model where we could predict what the bitter pit incidence would be in that fruit uh, after a few months in storage. So as you're well aware, we've been working on this since the fall of 2015. Um, and we rolled out uh, a model uh, for testing. Plus, uh, we're also evaluating uh, the Chris Watkins, uh, Yosef El Shaf passive model. Uh, we're doing a farm viability study around the state where we're looking to validate both the Eastern New York, what we call the EMR model for environmental mineral and rootstock, uh, and the passive model. They both have their strengths and weaknesses in, in terms of implementation. Uh, this coming Summer and fall will be the second year of the project. 
Uh, many of you are participating uh, in this project and appreciate your support. Uh, if uh, you want uh, to put a few additional blocks in, uh, I think the mineral analysis cost would be around 30 bucks a sample for, for a block, so it's quite reasonable. Let me know if you'd like to participate in that. Oh, probably in mid-July, I think as part of our Eastern New York uh, technology series, I'll be doing a, a webinar like this on the topic and we'll go through the model and, and the program. So please keep an eye for that and, uh, and tune in and be involved with it. With that, uh, any questions and, and thank you very much. All right, any questions for Dan? Thank you, Dan. And uh, thank you all for, for participating in, in this project. Uh, we appreciate your contributions to, to this work. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and going to launch into the final talk of the day. Uh, this one will be brief. And again, we are recording this. So if anybody does have to leave, you know, feel free to. Um, can everybody still see my, my screen? Good to me. All right. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, so we're going to wrap up today. I just want to briefly touch on uh, post-bloom weed management strategies. Uh, just a little bit of background. We generally think of May to July as really being our critical weed-free period in the orchard. Uh, this is really an important time. The weeds are going to be competing for water, for nutrients, um, and then also later in the season, you know, tall weeds can impede our later herbicide deposition. They can also serve as a pest habitat, and they can also interfere with our harvest operations. Uh, so really getting the weeds under control at, at this key stage can really help us with our, our crop come the fall. So just looking at 2020 weed management so far, you know, hopefully with that sort of extended tight cluster period and a little bit earlier, uh, that pre-bloom timing hopefully really allowed us to get some timely residual herbicide applications onto the, onto the rows. Uh, but as we, we get away from, from that pre-bloom period, you know, I really encourage everybody to just keep an eye on the herbicide strip and, and the sod middles and see what's coming up. And really, you know, as you're out putting out different applications, keeping an eye on that so that we can really strategize our, our weed management going forward. And really keeping an eye on what species you have present, what their growth habits are, and the different growth stages that they're at can really help us uh, coming up with an effective weed management program. I'll also say that right now, given our dry conditions, this can be a particularly challenging time to be managing these weeds post-emergence. Uh, just because when we get this, this dryness and this really hot weather, the weeds will put on a, a thicker cuticle and they're, they're going to be harder to treat. We usually like to treat them when they're a bit more succulent and, and growing more readily. But with that in mind, we'll talk about some of the main materials that we have available to us during this, this time of year. So Paraquat, common tree name Gramoxone, a very widely used product. This is a contact material, so it's going to be burning the tissue. And because of that, we want to make sure we have really good coverage with it. This is a good material for broadleaf and annual grass control, but because it's a contact, it is going to be poor for perennial control. And so again, uh, the caveat with this is it's best to put this on while the weeds are still small. Now, another really common contact material is glufosinate. Uh, two common tray names that you'll see are Rely and Cheetah. Again, this is another contact. This is good on annual broadleaves, a little bit more variable on annual grasses. And this one also poor perennial control since it is just a contact material. With it being a contact, again, I'd recommend when weeds are small. Another important note with glufosinate is uh, some reports out of Rutgers have shown that if it gets onto the trunk at all, serious trunk injury can, can occur. Uh, so with the use of glufosinate, we really recommend, as with all the other contact materials, really keeping it off of the trunk and only applying it to trees that have mature brown bark to avoid the more, the more serious potential for injury. A few other contacts that I want to talk about are the group 14s. These include tray names like AIM, Trevix, and Venue. Again, a couple other contacts. These are fairly selective, mostly used for annual broadleaf control. Again, poor perennial control. Similarly, best used when weeds are small. And the common recommendation that I see for these group 14s, uh, generally they're going to be used to speed 
the burn down of weeds when they're tank mixed with a systemic material. So as the systemic material slowly works its way into the perennial, uh, these will be tank mixed in just to give a, a bit quicker start to that burn down. And with these, because there's different specific products with these groups, the age restrictions will vary. And again, highly recommend keeping it off any green trunks. So now we'll go over to some systemic materials. Glyphosate, again, very common. Uh, this one's systemic and will disrupt plant growth. Very broad spectrum control, grasses, broad leaves, annual perennial. For these, we wanna be applying them when weeds are healthy and actively growing. So again, with the drought conditions, not the best time to use this material. And we also uh, really wanna stress the timing with these. Um, we don't like to put them on after early July and even earlier, potentially mid-June in a year like this where it might be really dry. And a big reason for this is because um, as we get later into the season, as the, the trees are starting to move some of the carbohydrates back to the roots, it actually has the potential to take up that glyphosate. And then we'll see that injury next season when those uh, carbohydrate reserves start being pushed out again. Uh, so we like to put this on no later than this sort of late spring, early summer timing. Again, a caveat with that, we want to avoid tree contact as much as possible with this material because it is systemic. And we really recommend not using it on trees that aren't at least in their third leaf. And also peaches are extremely sensitive to this one. So the other main systemic materials that we have available are the auxinic herbicides. And these include materials like 2,4-D and clopyrrolid. Uh, so these are both systemic, uh, generally more effective on broadleaves. So you can see for 2,4-D annual perennial broadleaves. Um, for 2,4-D in particular, it's a very volatile material. So the best management strategy with this one is using it late in the fall to clean up dandelions and some other broadleaves that are in the row middles a restriction of at least one year old for application. And we recommend that you do not apply to bare ground or to light sandy soils. For clopyrrolid, common name stinger or spur, uh, very effective on some key broad leaves, really the clovers, dandelions, nightshade. This is also a really good product for Canada thistle control. Again, the timing for this one, similar to 2,4-D, we recommend it late fall while the weeds are still actively growing before that first frost so you can get good control. And this one also carries a, a one year restriction. Then I have this table here, pretty much summarizing some of the main post-emergent materials available. There are some other ones on here. You can see post, which is mostly used for annual perennial grass control. Um, there's a few other materials I didn't touch on today, but that's all I'm going to cover for now. Um, so if anyone has any questions on weed management, I'm, I'm still available. I know we're, we're quite over time. Uh, so I would just like to thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to thank our speakers one more time. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Owesco, for uh, sponsoring these series of meetings. And I invite you all to join us again next week at the same time. We'll have Terrence back and Dan will be here as well. And we're going to discuss managing crop load at that 10 to 12 millimeter sweet spot. So are there any other questions? All right, well, I thank you all for joining us today and we will have this recording up in a few days and feel free to reach out with any questions in the meantime. Thank you.